Hello and welcome to Conscious TV. I'm Im McNay and my guest today is Philip Jacobs. And I first saw Philip a couple of, a couple of years ago and asked me I went to what's called a turning evening at Collett House in West London. And what that is, that is really, it's, it's kind of whirling dervishes. And, and Philip is the chic of the group in, in, in London. And it was the most, everybody there is English, or I think they're all English, and it's just extraordinary experience. And I had the back of my mind to do an interview with Philip about his life and about the turning. And it's taken a bit of time, as it often does with Conscious TV, for things to come together. But he's now here in the studio with me. I'm looking forward to this interview very much. And to start with, he's written some books, uh, One Self, Life as a Means of Transformation, and Being the Teaching of Advaita, a Basic Introduction. And then the one I like the most, which isn't published yet, which I have a, have a, a pre-copy here, if you like, which will be published, I hope, maybe next year, 2014, The Pathless Path, A Journey to the Place Never Left, which is mainly autobiographical. So we're going to look at, look at Philip's life and his spiritual journey, a little bit about the turning and many other things that come up in our limited time of an hour. So let's start with, with your childhood where you had a, had a great love of nature. You, like, you like finding wild places. I think you live by the Thames and yeah. you get on a boat and go in the middle of the Thames and find somewhere really quiet to hang out. Um, I grew up in a town called East Molesey, and our house was along a little river called the Ember. And it was great because the, we had this great sort of long river frontage. And as children, I had a brother and a sister, and we all had our own boats. And so all the time, all through the summer and the winter, we used to go off and have these adventures, and we used to have sea battles with children from further down the river. and. It just gave me such a love of nature, seeing the way the river changed and the seasons changed and how the snow used to come and the frost and then the nettles rose up in the springtime. It just sort of got me off to being in such a lovely environment, instilled a great love of nature in me right from the beginning. Mm. And then you were given a book by a guy called Lobsang Rampa, who I haven't heard of, called The Third Eye. And that really opened things up for you, didn't it, in terms of the spiritual world? It did, because at the time I was away at boarding school. And boarding school is pretty dire, <laughs> because it's a sort of world of getting up at seven in the morning and studying French verbs and 19th century English history and playing rugger out on the sports field. And I'd been interested in Oriental art since I was about 11. And my brother and I had both been buying Buddhas and Tibetan things with our pocket money. And then one day my mother sent me this book by Lobsang Rampa called The Third Eye. And he was supposedly a Tibetan Lama. But what I didn't know at the time was he was actually the son of a plumber from Plimpton in Devon. <laughs> <laughs> but what he wrote um, was miraculous enough to inspire my 14-year-old mind. And it was suddenly like this whole new world opened up. And I thought, why, why did no one tell me this other world existed? Reading the Bhagavad Gita at that time wouldn't have had much impression on me, so it needed to be something very overtly miraculous. Yeah, and at 14, that's quite something, because most boys of 14 are thinking of something completely different. I think it was, you have to remember, it was in the 1960s, and since the Beatles had gone into Eastern mysticism, it was very much around everywhere. And also, my father had died of cancer at home when I was nine. Mm. And that had sort of made me start looking in other directions. 
so I was no longer just sort of taking life on its sort of surface value. I was sort of wondering where he'd gone and what it was all about. So I, I definitely started looking by that time. Mm. And then I think your mother sent you a book uh, by Francis Rolls. Yeah. And that again opened something, didn't it? Yeah, that was because I wrote, I wrote a poem inspired by Lob Sang Rampa, which got into the school magazine. And then my mother, being a proud mother, showed it to all her friends. And by a series of coincidences, it found its way to Dr. Francis Rolls, who had been a follower of the Russian writer P. D. Uspensky. And he sent me this book called Waking Up, which he had written about a system of meditation from the Advaita tradition. So that sort of followed on from Lobsang Rampa. And his Waking Up book sort of became my Bible for the next couple of years. And you actually went to his centre in Collet House in West London and you, you, did, you started to learn meditation at 16 years old. Yeah, um, I wanted to learn <coughs> it when I was 14, when I first read the book, but I think they thought I was too young. So I had to wait till Dr. Rolls agreed to initiate me when I was 16. And then I had to escape from boarding school because it wasn't a very popular thing to go off and learn a form of meditation in London. Um, but eventually, um, I had to threaten my mother. I said, if you don't write the headmaster a letter saying I want to go and learn to meditate, I'm going anyway, so I'll get into trouble. So she um, reluctantly wrote a letter saying she granted her permission. Then I went up to London and Dr. Rolls taught me how to meditate. But what does the school headmaster at a boarding school say that a, a boy wants to go and go to meditate? It's, it's an unusual thing for a boy to have that, have that desire. I think it was sort of outside of their remit. And I think generally they found me a bit difficult to understand. And two examples of that were after I'd learned to meditate, I used, the prefects used to wake me up half an hour before everyone else, so I could do my meditation, which was very nice of them. Uh -huh. And when I had my own room a bit later, once the housemaster came in early in the morning to wake me up, and I was sitting in the half lotus position, and then the deputy housemaster came in a couple of weeks later, and I was still in the half lotus position. And then they were overheard to say, it's best to leave Jacobs to himself. So. After that, they just sort of, um, I did get completely left to myself and I could really do what I wanted. Mm. And did you find a lot of peace in meditation at that point? I did, it was, it was fantastic because, I don't know if you know boarding school life, but um, in the morning you're sort of fast asleep, having a lovely dream that you're at home or you're by the river. And suddenly a prefect comes in and says, right, three to get out of bed and blows a whistle. and and then it's down to a lots of rows of wash basins and then down to a noisy dining hall. But getting up half an hour before everyone, mm. and then initially I used to go and meditate down in the school chapel. And then I went into the dining hall and it was like, it was a sort of inner glow. So no longer were you the victim of the dining hall. It was like you were looking out on the dining hall from this sense of stillness. Mm. And I'd also been a very sort of rebellious adolescent and I was quite a troublemaker. And I suddenly started to see, see it from the master's point of view. And I suddenly sort of realized that they probably didn't really want to be schoolmasters and they were just trying to earn their living. So it was like there was this sudden sort of um, shift in perspective to seeing, seeing it from other people's points of view. So most of my adolescent angst sort of started to evaporate at that point. And it was interesting um, just, just to briefly cover what was happening at Collet House. So Dr. Francis Rolls, he'd learned from Spensky, 
and then Spencer, of course, had been a student of, of Gurdjieff mm -hmm. before that. And there was also a, a connection with the Maharishi, wasn't mm -hmm. there? And the Maharishi taught at Collet House yeah. for a time when he was over. Yeah. And just <clears throat> to give you a brief potted history, Uspensky had always been interested in the study of consciousness. And by consciousness, he meant the awareness we have behind our thoughts and our feelings and our desires. And he'd written quite a sort of intelligent book right back at the start of the 20th century. And then he'd gone off to India looking for methods to access that consciousness more fully. But he didn't find what he was looking for. And then the First World War broke out and he had to go back to Russia where he was mobilized. <clears throat> and then he met this enigmatic um, Greek teacher called Gurdjieff. And for a while he thought he'd found what he was looking for in Gurdjieff's teachings. But gradually their paths deviated. And I think Uspensky strongly disagreed with Gurdjieff's methods, which could be quite violent. And so Spensky carried on separately. And he partly developed his own ideas and partly taught what he'd learned from Gurdjieff. And towards the end of his life, it was like he went right beyond what he'd been teaching. He went right beyond what he'd learned from Gurdjieff. And right at the end, he said, I abandon the system and you must reconstruct it all from the very beginning. And this sort of threw people into a bit of confusion because they'd become so dependent on the particular metaphors that he'd been teaching. And he privately prepared some of his followers, one of whom was Dr. Rawls, to, after his death, to find what he'd actually been looking for in the first place. And it was, Uspensky died in 1947, and it wasn't till 1961 that Dr. Rolls made contact with the Advaita, or non-dual tradition in India, which has existed for many hundreds of years as a sort of advisory tradition. And the Maharishi was a sort of step in the process of that meeting. Um, Uspensky had told Dr. Rolls to look for a method that involves repeating one word. Those were Uspensky's actual words. So when he met the Maharishi, he realized that he'd found the method that Uspensky had asked him to look for. Because um, the Maharishi worked with a, a mantra team, yeah, worked with a mantra, yeah. yeah. It's mantra meditation. And then the Maharishi introduced Dr. Rolls a bit later to the head of his tradition which was, in India, they have this, um, the Advaita tradition was originally founded by someone called Shankara, somewhere around the 6th to the 9th century, no one's quite sure when. And he set up four seats of learning, so you have a, one of the north, south, west and east. And Dr. Rolls, the Maharishi introduced Dr. Rolls to the Shankaracharya of the north. Yes. And he became his guide and advisor teacher for about the next 20 years. Mm. So it gradually sort of, it evolved. Um, and in Uspensky's day, it was very strict. And it was what was known as an esoteric school. And when Do just before Dr. Rolls died, he said, our role as an esoteric school is over. So he said, no more secrecy. I want the Collet House of, a f of the Future to be a place like a cell of self-knowledge that people can come to for rest and refreshment. And he said, particularly for young people for whom life's very difficult today. So it went through, it, through this sort of path, a process of evolution. And one of the things that you, you learnt there, which I think was Spensky and Gurdjieff, was this self-remembering. How, how was that to start with for you, the self-remembering? It was the self-remembering was the whole sort of key cornerstone of what Gurdjieff had taught and what Uspensky taught. But apparently 
obviously I never knew Spensky because he died long before I was born. But he found it very difficult to convey what he meant. And at the time, I think people had a lot of trouble understanding what he was trying to convey. Um, I personally don't use the term anymore. It sort of belongs to history. But my understanding of it is you have an identity in time, which in my case is Philip. And Philip is a man, and Philip is an artist, and Philip does all the sort of Philip things. And the Philip identity is always changing. So when Philip was five, Philip liked certain things. And then it keeps changing and evolving. And um, But behind that, behind I am Philip, is just the pure sense of I am, or the pure sense of being. So this isn't obscure, it's so universal. When you're five, there's something looking out through your eyes, which is exactly the same as when you're 55. It's totally timeless, it doesn't change, it's totally still, it's totally unaffected by what goes on in the changing drama. So, my understanding of self-remembering is remembering, but behind it all, I'm not just Philip, I'm this great stillness that lies behind Philip, and which is universal and common to all of us. And is that something you felt you were aware of when you started to meditate at 16 years old? When I was very young, and when I was out in nature, I used to have these moments of intense happiness when it was just like happiness would arise for no reason. Mm. And it often happened like when I was, I remember one occasion when I was watching this raging storm at sea and I was just standing watching it. I was about 10 years old, I think, or nine. And I remember watching it and think, thinking, just remember this sensation that you're feeling now. Remember it, remember it when you're at school and you're in a maths lesson. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my sort of early understanding of self-remembering. Yeah. That it was, it's just your natural state, it's who you are. The other state, the I am Philip, is superimposed on top of that. Mm. And it's a very sort of fluid thing which just changes and when you go to sleep at night it completely disappears. So, I think more and more, when you're often at first, the, the deeper state is like the background and the I am something or I am Philip is on the, in the foreground. But I think as life goes on, there's a subtle switching between the two. So, uh, as we talk now, yeah. are you aware of the background? How, how is it now? The background is always there. It's like it's like you're looking out from the background. So that's with you most of the time. This looking looking out the what I would call maybe the vastness. You'd call I think more the peacefulness. I sort of think it's it's with everyone all the time, but you just don't they don't I'm know not it. Aware of it. Yeah. It's what is looking out, what is seeing through your eyes, yes. what is hearing. There's just this mis misidentification of what's actually happening. Mm. And most non-dual teachings are simply pointing out what's actually happening now, as opposed to what you think's happening now, or what mm. your mind's superimposed on that. Mm. So it's actually happening to everyone all the time. The other thing that you, you mention in the autobiography, which I, I, I reminded me of something I used to do when I lived in a community many years ago, was the stop exercise. Yeah. Where you ring a bell. Yeah. Everyone had to stop when I lived in this community for a time in northern Italy. And that was so effective because you're, you're busy doing what you're doing and then the bell goes. And for 30 seconds you just stop. Yeah. And it reminds you, doesn't it? It takes you yeah. in and stillness. You see the stillness or feel the stillness that's, that's nice, there. That. We used to have Dr. Rolls used to do that sometimes. He'd shout stop. 
and we'd all freeze. <laughs> yes. That I find it's like when you see something incredibly beautiful in nature or a work of art, it, it has that same effect. It just suddenly moving mind stops and you've, you're sort of in a state of awe at it all. Yes. And, and I, I don't want to keep the whole thing biographical, but I'm just, yeah. just getting some triggers here. But you were very committed because the other thing that Spensky was really very committed to was this turning. Yeah. Do you want to just talk us through that? How yeah, that... I'll talk you through yeah. that. Um, in the early 20th century, Spensky had visited the Mevlevi dervishes in Turkey, mostly in Istanbul, several times. And he writes about them in two of his books. And he had meetings with some of the sheikhs. And so he always saw dervish turning as he thought it was a, a method, again, for accessing this deeper uh, sense of self. And in 1963, that was shortly after Dr. Earls had made contact with the Advaita tradition. Um, one of the Collet House members had a Turkish boy working on her farm, and he had an uncle who was a Mevlevi dervish out in Turkey. And he invited some of the Collet House members out to a, a ceremony in Konya. Because what had happened is back in the 1920s, Kemal Ataturk, the then ruler of Turkey, had banned all dervish orders and all Sufi orders and all fortune tellers and anything he thought was holding Turkey back from being a modern Western nation because it was shortly after the Ottoman Empire had ended and he was trying to move Turkey on. So prior to that, most towns had what's known as a Mevlevi Teke, which is a place where the whirling dervishes whirled. And after that, it all had to go secret. So the poor dervishes, if they were caught turning, they could go to prison. So they had to draw their curtains and turn secretly in their living room carpets. And in the late 50s, it was just started to be allowed again as a tourist attraction. And they were having these annual ceremonies in, in Konya, in Turkey, which is where Jalaluddin Rumi had lived, who was the founder of the Mevlevi. And so um, three of the Collet House members went out to the ceremony, and they caught the eye of the sheikh who was providing over the ceremony in Konya. And he was a Mevlevi sheikh. He'd been a Mevlevi since he was a little boy and his name was Rezui Bekara. And afterwards, um, he talked to the Collet House members, and they asked him, would he be prepared to come over to London and teach for turning to Western people? And he went and spoke to his sheikh, who was a, um, a man called Munir Chelebi. And Munir Chelebi said, yes, you must go and teach for turning in London. And so Rezui came over, and he was a civil servant, so he'd only got a month's annual holiday. So he trained 60 people in a month to do this very difficult movement and to learn all the prayers and all the ceremonial. And then by the time he went back at the end of it, the turning, the Mevlevi tradition was up and running at Collet House, where it's been taught and practiced ever since. But he was very radical and very far-seeing because in Turkey at the time it was only taught to men and he came over and he taught it to both men and women mm. together. Yeah. So I think he probably got into a bit of trouble from hardliners when he went home again. And this turning was something that was very attractive to you as well, wasn't it? When I was 16, just after I'd learnt to meditate on a half-term holiday, um, I went up and watched a public ceremony. And watching it just made me so happy. It was a bit like watching a rock concert, in a huh. way. Huh. But it, it was live music, and it was, it was just something that really... I went away just sort of beaming all over my face. Huh. And I thought, if it can do that for 
someone watching it, what must it be like to actually turn in there? Yeah. We were talking earlier, and I want to make a separate program about the turning, yeah. so we won't go into too much detail on that, but um, I was just looking at my notes from your book, and, and, and your, your life became very busy. You're up at five o'clock in the morning to learn the turning, uh, and then you had your full day and your meditation and your, and your earning your living and everything else. And you said you had just incredible energy afterwards with the turning. When just... I was, yeah. When I was learning it, I was doing my degree show for my um, textile course in Liberties in Regent Street. We were down in the basement. And I used to go in at about, I don't know, about nine o'clock, all sort of beaming, like I'd been up all day. And the other art students had all just sort of crawled out of bed. Yes. So it was... It did give me this amazing energy just just doing the training. Yeah. And it also said around this time that I began to notice that life appeared to be unfolding like a drama or play, much like a multi-dimensional jigsaw puddle puzzle where everything appeared to slot together to form one whole. That's the most amazing thing I've learned about life. Um, which is often quite difficult to convey, is at one time I thought that I was this sort of separate person weaving my way through life and you had to manipulate things or things wouldn't go your way or you might meet an accident. And that's a very sort of frightening view of life. And the way it turned around and how it appears now is that there isn't a separate Philip trying to manipulate the separate life. It's like it's one immaculately produced movie or drama, and I'm just watching it unfold. As Philip, I'm not doing anything or creating anything. It's just like I'm amazed at the precision of how things unfold, and even things which at the time seemed to be total, absolute disasters. And then I look back a year or two later and I think, my God, if that hadn't happened, this would never have yes. happened. And then once you've really got that, it takes a while for that view to sort of percolate down through all your being. But once it does percolate, then you have a much sort of lighter view of life. You're not pushing and pulling it. You're, you're trusting the way it unfolds from moment to moment. But you see, how does this fit in with being on a spiritual path? And as many of us do, think, oh, we're working our word, way towards clearing our personality, shedding traumas, whatever, and one day will be enlightened, will be at one. It's like the separateness is walking, working towards the oneness. But from what you're saying, it isn't quite like that, is it? I don't see it like that. I sort of see the two identities. So there's I am something or I am Philip on the line of time. And then there's the pure beingness, which you might say is here somewhere just for convenience sake. On the line of time, you're, going, it, you're always going to be in process. So now you'll have sort of boarding school traumas that you process and you'll have relationship traumas that you process. And probably when you're 80 years old, you get put in an old people's home and there's more traumas to process. <laughs> Even more traumas, yeah. So at that level, you're never going to resolve things. It's always going to be one process after another process. What I think you notice at a certain point is what you are is always there independent of any process. So you can do all the spiritual exercises you want and that will happen in your particular drama or movie. Whatever's on your particular film will happen and that might include being a whirling dervish, it might include meditating, it might include going to church. Whatever's right for you will happen. But at a certain point, you'll notice that what you really are has always been there, almost at right angles to that line of time. 
The great stillness isn't along here waiting to be realized. The great stillness was looking out through your eyes right from the beginning. Mm. So it's almost like on the line of time, you exhaust the process. You exhaust the process of looking for something in time until you, you actually come to a realization that it isn't in time. It's always been looking out through your eyes. Because Dr. Rowles died in the last year of his life, he talked quite a lot in the book about how he saw things differently from it had been a bottom-up approach and he now saw it as a top-down approach. Yeah. I was sort of aware during his last year in particular that he was getting very frustrated with us because for a long time he'd sort of taught the Uspensky system, Uspensky Gurdjieff. Then he'd gradually introduced the Advaita into it. And for a long time, I think he'd tried to sort of look at Advaita from a Uspensky point of view. And then he suddenly realized that the Advaita viewpoint was completely different to the Uspensky one. He described Uspensky teaching as a bottom-up system and Advaita as top-down. So the more he went into this, the more he discovered and the more he tried to convey to us something new he had discovered. But I could see him getting really frustrated because we kept going back to the old metaphors. And then, almost the day before he died, almost his last words were something like, <clears throat> we've had everything upside down and back to front. The need now is for simplicity. There's only one consciousness the levels are levels of impediment to that consciousness. Everything is that consciousness. That is what we have to feel and know. So that was sort of like his parting message. Everything is that consciousness. There's only one consciousness. Back then, it was quite a, a radical thing to say. Nowadays, almost everyone's saying it. But, yes. Um, so my particular interest back then, that was 1982, was working, that worked away in me. I wanted to discover what he meant. I wanted to find out what he'd discovered. Yeah, one thing you talk about again in the book is like when you were writing a paper with Peter Fennick. Yeah. And Peter Fennick got you to be really precise yeah. with the language because it's so difficult to get, even writing one sentence, you can get yeah. caught and get the wording slightly wrong, which gives you an impression of the Yeah. I don't know if you remember what that case was. I remember it, yeah. So. I probably can't remember the exact words. And I probably can, actually. I've been working with Peter Fennick for quite a few years, writing papers and doing meetings. And we used to write the paper together. I used to go over to his house for supper. And then by the end of the day, we'd have a paper done. And one day, I wrote the paper before I went to him. And I wrote we have a responsibility to manifest the truth. And he said, the paper's great apart from that one phrase. So I was able to pick out that phrase, that responsibility implied a sense of separateness yes. and doership. Yes. So he yeah. made me take, he made me find out what I'd done wrong. Yes. And then I removed it. Then we never worked together again. Because yes. the, he had played his role. This precision of how you say and how you think and how you write. Yeah. It's so important, is it? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just picking things out that interest me from the, uh, the biography here. And you, you started to research an aspect of the Advaita teaching known as Antakara. Antakara. Yes. Yeah. Which I hadn't heard that name before, but just, it, but it's like the inner vehicle yeah. the soul. Just talk us through that. Yeah. In the Advaita tradition, um, there are different levels of identity. For many people, you don't need all these levels. You just need the sense of oneness, and people get it instantly. But in most non-dual traditions, reality is portrayed as manifesting through a series of levels, albeit metaphorical. It's a bit like... From the bottom up, there appear to be lots of levels. Yes. From the top down, there aren't any levels. There's just oneness. 
And with the individual, again, this is traditional advice, to, the way the one consciousness manifests as an individual is through what's known as the inner vehicle. And so, anta karana, car, the word car is, in India they have these big temple chariots called cars, and we get our word motor car from it, which is a vehicle um, for a motor. Whereas aham in Sanskrit means I, it's just the pure sense of I. So aham kara means vehicle for your sense of I. Okay. So in a vehicle, it's the Indian equivalent of a Christian concept of a soul. Mm. So it's like, um, yes, it's a vehicle through which consciousness manifests as an individual in the drama of consciousness. Um, if you're going for total oneness, then you don't even get stuck at the antikarana. It's quite a useful, in life, it's quite a useful thing to know about in understanding the mechanism. So it's not who we really are. It's not who you really are. But it, 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 it's like a halfway house, is yeah. that right? Somehow? Yeah. Some people need a halfway house. Yes. Other people don't. But it, it's quite a useful way of explaining things to people who want explanations. Yeah. But ultimately, anything less than the whole, the totality, is a limitation. Yes, yes. And in, in the school I've been in for many years, it's, it's known as the personal essence. Yeah. And I, I found that remarkably helpful, yeah. actually. And it took me a long time to realise that wasn't ultimately who I was. No. But on the human level, it helps to take me away from, from the, the gross identification of the I. Yeah. Um, so it has a, well, for me anyway, it's it's, very it useful. has a value, yeah. In the yeah. Uspensky tradition, they had essence and personality. So you, you yes. had essence was a deeper sense of self. Yes. But still not the ultimate. Yes. And I just put out this thing here um, where you, after the turning, you would go, you would maybe have a person, you sometimes have relationship problems with your girlfriend at the oh, time, right. whatever. <laughs> and you'd go into the turning and you'd be in like inner chaos. And you'd come out of it half an hour later. And it would be, someone would say to you, are you okay, Philip? You say, what a preposterous question. Of course I'm all right. It's like it kind of, what would happen? Would it dissolve or you would get a, you'd realize who you really were or? That particular occasion was very powerful. It was when I was 28 and I was um, always having romantic traumas back then. <laughs> <laughs> but it was after a big relationship breakup and it probably was the worst day of my life, I think. Um, and then I went and turned back the next day, I went and turned in the macabre belay, the ceremony. And by the end of it, I just felt so happy. And I knew I was having a trauma, but the trauma was all going on over there somewhere. And I was just in this, in this great happiness. And the lady, a good friend of mine called Annie, came up and said to me, are you all right? And I thought, what a ridiculous question. <laughs> Because the trauma was over there. Yeah. So it was, it was such, it is turning, it's such a lovely way of, of accessing that, the great stillness, which then manifests in time and space as a great happiness. And in a way, of course, the trauma is always over there. If it's anywhere, it's yeah. over there. But we forget, don't we, or somehow we get so absorbed in the trauma and the, the dramas, yeah. the drama of the situation that seems we're consumed by it. Yeah, there's a lovely metaphor I heard um, Timothy Freak say, and he said that life's like a journey from A to B. And on that journey, you'll go through swamps and jungles and deserts and the open road. And everyone sort of has that journey. And when you're on the open road, then everyone think, you think, oh, I'm really enlightened and I'm doing really well. And then suddenly you find yourself in the inevitable swamp again and things don't look so bright. So life has a way, however much you think you've gone beyond it or you've transcended suffering, life 
knows how to put you right back in it again. Mm. So it's like never sort of get complacent about it. It can always draw you back in again if, if that's part of a movie. And you, of course, had a good example of this because you got very sick, didn't you? Yeah. You got Lyme disease, yeah. which really knocked yeah. you out at times. Yeah, I've had about 21 years of illness, which before that, I remember a friend and I both got ill at the same time, and we were probably a bit too blissful for our own good, I think. And then we suddenly got this illness, which... Um, was completely overpowering and life could suddenly look very bleak and so it was almost like the the non-dual realization had to permeate down through all different aspects of life mm. so <clears throat> you almost have to go into the bleak place as, as the dark place as well as the other place then you start to see them both as the same thing, but you have to go there. Yes, and on a human level, that's quite challenging at that's times. That's quite challenging. It has been challenging. Yes, yeah. And, and you talk about there's four levels, don't you? Yeah. Just, just explain the four levels. That's in the Advaita tradition. Again, if you just want oneness, forget this. <laughs> just go for oneness. But if you want... Again, how consciousness manifests as a creation. In, <clears throat> in the Christian tradition, they have, in the early Christian church, they had body, soul, and spirit. And that's a very good concept because if you're just a body, soul, then God is up there somewhere. With body, soul, and spirit, God and your deepest identity are one and the same thing. So your spirit is the same as the universal spirit. In the Advaita tradition, they have physical, subtle, causal, and divine. Physical is flesh and bones, body and world. Um, subtle is your psyche, so that's your feeling and thinking processes. So it's also it's a dream world at night. So it's sort of private to you. And that's sort of what's often referred to, I think, in Zen as the mind-body mechanism. And for many people, identity stops at the mind-body mechanism. So if someone says, who are you, you identify with both body and, and mind. But when you're thinking and when you're feeling, there's also an awareness behind that of the thinking and the feeling. So is what we talked about earlier. There's an identity behind the moving mind, behind the changing personality, which doesn't change, which is always still. And that equates in the Advaita tradition with the causal level. And it's also the realm of dreamless sleep. So sleep with dreams at night, when you're in this dream world, is subtle level, then at a certain point that disappears and there's total timelessness. When you go into deep sleep or deep meditation, there's no time at all. So you can fall asleep at midnight and wake up at seven and it's like it's almost in instantaneous. No time has happened. So that's referred to as the causal level. And the divine level is really just a fuller understanding of that. And the divine refers to the ground of all being. With the causal, it's like you've accessed this inner stillness and you're looking out on the world from the point of view of stillness, like I described in the dining hall at school. But there's still a subtle subject object because there's still you as stillness looking out on the manifest world. With the divine, it's like the subject and object duality collapses and you realise that everything you'd perceived as external is actually taking place within this stillness that is yourself. I think that's also known as the absolute, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. And, and, and do you find these four levels still helpful or do you feel that 
now you're that, that, that's not relevant to you I find them really helpful still yes. really helpful and when you're explaining this again it, it's a wonderful meta metaphor to use and it's so brilliant to understanding different aspects of life and things like suffering and all the things that happen yes yeah I almost feel we, we, we should make a separate program about, about how, you, how you handled your illness because it, it brought up so many things yeah. and, there's, and there's, so many, there's so much depth there. But, but, but one, one of the things that I, I, I really liked was the way that you, and I think we all have that, it's also part of the ageing process too, for me certainly, that you can't do what you used to do and you kind of, you find things that bring you joy. And I love the stories that... You want to talk about the two main things that you found that brought you joy when you were so ill? Was the, well, don't you remember what they were? There was the. There was dinosaur hunting. Dinosaur hunting. <laughs> that, that was the, that, and there was also the one about the uh, uh, things being swept down by the river. Oh, that was it, yeah. yes. Yes, there are two. But, but, but yeah. talk about the dinosaur hunting, because yeah. that's, that's tremendously yeah. interesting. I, I love dinosaur hunting. I've always loved looking for things um, and finding things. It's sort of, it's a bit like. Uh, a metaphor of a whole drama of consciousness, how um, consciousness manifests as apparent separateness and then it has to rediscover itself. And when I was younger, I used to love sort of climbing mountains in the snow and things. And when I got poorly, I couldn't do that anymore. But I could still walk along my favourite bit of beach looking for dinosaur bones. And this became such an absorbing passion that soon I was often discovering whole skeletons embedded in, in the hard well, rock. You, that's right, you get, you get this story, you found this whole I had found, skeleton, fossil, yeah. whole, it's, a, it, it's a fossil, it's not the actual... It's a fossil, I, fossil, found, yeah. I found, first of all, I'd found lots and lots of bones, sort of li great limb bones and vertebra, and once I was walking along with a girlfriend, on the beach. I just found this, I said, oh, I found a vertebra. It was just this single vertebra in the clay. So I got my chisel out and I started chiseling away. And then it became another vertebra. Then it became another one. Then it became another one. And I thought, oh, I've got a, I've got a row of vertebra. And then I suddenly found um, ribs were going off it. And then I thought, hang on, I've got a skeleton here. And then this very famous fossil hunter called Steve Etches came along. He caught me at it. And said, <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh dear. And he said, you're doing what the Victorians do. You're just collecting the backbone. So then he helped me excavate the whole thing. And you have to sort of chisel out a hu huge, great sort of slabs. So you have to dig a trench in the rock with chisels. It, it took about a couple of weeks to do. And then you get chisels underneath the slabs, and eventually it comes up in sections. And uh, then you had to get a boat to sort of carry it back down, down, down the beach. So you've got a dinosaur at home now. Um, I've actually got a friend's looking after the dinosaur <laughs> at the moment. I had to move house a couple of years ago to a smaller house. Yeah. So most of my dinosaurs are being looked after at the moment. And, 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 and how old is that dinosaur then? Um, uh, she's 153 million years, give or take a million. Yeah. I've got about probably bits of about 50 different um, huh. reptiles huh. and dinosaurs. Huh. But it's, it's a wonderful thing to do. Um, it's so wonderful when you sort of get a chisel under a slab, and then you lift it up and you just don't know what's going to be underneath it. It's like, a bit like opening your Christmas present. Huh. And the other thing you loved doing was, was, was uh, I think it's the Medway, there was... Oh yeah, clay pipes. Clay, clay pipes you used to find. Yeah, it was, I used to stay with some friends in the Medway and they'd dug up several clay pipes in their gardens, thing, beautiful things like, modelled like acorns. So I then started sort of researching about how in Victorian times rubbish was taken down the Thames in barges and then it was dumped into these muddy creeks in the Medway towns and places like Sittingbourne. And then, so I'd go off exploring these muddy creeks and you'd find all this Victorian rubbish just sort of oozing out of the ground in the muddy banks. And the thing I did love, it was the clay pipes, because 
in the late 19th century, they were very ornate and they had famous people's heads as the bowls. So it was people like Lord Baden Powell and Buffalo Bill, and it was, <laughs> it was just so fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to invite you back because, in a way, we've only covered part of your story and it's almost like the highlights. Mm. So if you're able to do that, I'd love to invite you back. I'd love to, thank you. And also, we need to make a separate programme about the turning, too. Yeah. And I, my idea was to get some fellow turners and, and also some footage and just yeah. make a whole programme there because I'm looking at the clock and uh, the uh, element of time, which is the bottom of the four yeah. levels, is yeah. unfortunately uh, catching up with you catching up with us. So, Philip, I want to thank you very much for coming into Conscious TV. I'm going to show your, um, your two books again. Being the Teaching of Advaita, a Basic Introduction, and Oneself, life, uh, life as a Means of Transformation. And I think, from memory, this is the one that has quite a lot about your illness that's and about right. how you handled yeah. that. So, for someone that's a bit, as you put it, a bit poorly, and you were more than a bit poorly at times, this is, this is such an insight into how to handle very difficult physical situations. So, thank you again, Philip. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone out there, for watching Conscious TV. And uh, I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye.